Welcome back, everyone. We've seen many times on this channel that rabbinic legends have a tendency to show up later in Islamic literature, rebranded as divine revelation from Allah. For example, there's that time when the Talmudic legend about Ashmedai was repurposed for one of the Quran's many legends about Solomon. There are also rabbinic legends about Abraham and the idols that show up in several chapters. And how about that rabbinic wordplay that ends up having the waters of Noah's flood boiling? Yep, that made it into the Quran as well. And one of my personal favorites is the water test for Jewish mystics being applied to the Queen of Sheba in Surah 27. And before we go any further, let's go ahead and address those predictable responses we've seen so many times. Number one, the Quran isn't borrowing. Yeah, right. Number two, the specific parts of the numerous sources the Quran borrowed from are also the inspired, perfectly preserved word of Allah. How convenient. Having given those shallow and inadequate responses all the attention they deserve, we note that of course this is not just a Quranic problem. Muslim authors in general borrowed heavily from Jewish sources, while at the same time pretending not to be influenced by those sources, and of course at the same time hating the Jews, an anti-Semitic religion borrowing stories from the Jews. Ah, the irony of history. Now let's look at another example that's widely attested in Muslim sources that looks suspiciously like something that comes again from Jewish folklore. From the, you guessed it, Babylonian Talmud, and the sages say, when Moses was born, the whole house was filled with light. Here it is written, and when she saw him, that he was good. And elsewhere it is written, and God saw the light, that it was good. Most of you know where this is going in the end, but let's pause for a second and figure out exactly what the rabbis were doing. If you've watched this channel for very long, you've seen it before. Moses' mother saw that he was good in Exodus 2. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was good, she hid him three months. And God saw the light was good in Genesis 1. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. Do you see that careful exegesis of the biblical text? Or maybe not. God saw the light was good. Moses' mother saw that Moses was good. Therefore, the whole house filled with light when he was born. By those same interpretive rules, we could conclude that Moses was good. The light was good. Therefore, Moses was created in Genesis 1. Or since Moses was hidden for three months, the light of Genesis 1 was hidden for three months. Or it took three months for God to create the light or separate it from the darkness. And since this occurred on the first day of creation, then a day must equal three months. There's no logical limit to this nonsense. Note that this style of interpretation is what Muslims rely on when they quote those rabbinic legends about Rebekah and Bathsheba's age in an attempt to make it look like their prophet wasn't the only 50-something-year-old man to sleep with a child. The Quran and various other Muslim sources took these rabbinic legends as truth inadvertently, and Muslim apologists today continue to embrace and assert the truth of rabbinic folklore when it serves their agenda. Not much has changed, has it, Muslims? Now let's get to what you knew was coming all along. As Muslim websites are happy to report, the Quran's entirely unmiraculous messenger apparently had a miraculous birth strikingly similar to that of Moses in rabbinic legend. Many sources from Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hajar, Ibn Kathir, and more say something to the effect that when Muhammad was born, a bright light shone far and wide. Did Muslim authors borrow and adapt rabbinic legend again? And given the ways that Muslim authors attempted to set Muhammad and Moses on analogy to each other, it seems like a plausible theory. But here's the problem. The theology in Muslim sources is nothing close to the Torah, which the Quran claims to endorse, and nothing close to biblical theology more broadly. So the attempted analogies with Moses can only be superficial, and in this case, apparently based on eccentric and indefensible rabbinic speculation. Thus, in the legends surrounding Muhammad's birth, Muslims once again wed themselves to rabbinic legend, as they have for centuries. These legends have been so deeply ingrained in the Muslim world that it's hard to imagine Islamic sources or Muslim apologetics and polemics without them, just like it's hard to imagine the religion of Islam without anti-Semitism. Again, the irony is tangible. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.